Hey all you happy lost souls. Uh, if you're new to the channel, that's great. Please subscribe, um, hit the little bell icon, stay notified in the loop. Um, my channel is pretty basic. It's just uh, a lot of original music and uh, my research uh, on a collection of artifacts uh, and also rock counting. Like I, I'm into geology and uh, things like that. But I have uh, a lot of theories on some of the crazy things that we find in these streams and uh, tributaries that um, are all part of a interconnected watershed uh, going back to Delaware. So um, most of the streams are connector streams or tributary streams of the Delaware Uh the one that's in my backyard, essentially, um, is known as the Penny Pack. Uh, this is a uh, a Dutch um, uh, enunciation of um, an Algonquin name or place name for the creek and uh, even further back if you trace the etymology of the um, origins of the words and the names which I'm super into um, you can find out a lot of in information on the anthropological side of things and that's kind of what you know I went to school for in, 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 um, and my training is in uh, mainly in the anthropology area now, <clears throat> what a, I've always been obsessed with like patterns and, and things like that. So that that's very important when, when you're finding things and, and you're trying to piece together theories and, and whatnot. Now these streams, um, these place names, they're, they're ancient. So the word Algonquin itself means, you know, the original ones, uh, I believe. And then penny pack itself is deep dark dead water um, or water that flows uphill um, it comes from the Algonquin Peña Paca or Peña Pac and then it goes further back to Pana or to Pene Pana which um, they believe meant lake of the dead or um Swamp, you know. Now, this is as far back as the writings of the Europeans that came in contact with the Native Americans. As far back around here, at best, late 1500s, believe it or not, there were people in. The area of southeastern Pennsylvania where I am but anyway the Pennypack Creek is very unique it's different than the others it sits in a crazy unique geological situation the creek is born from underground aquifers limestone aquifers um, in the Warminster area um, in a speedway neighborhood as it's so so called um, near uh, near where the Battle of Crooked Bill it was actually but anyways as I digress uh, and babble on uh, what we have to to realize is that makes it sacred a fresh source of water coming out of the ground all ancient cultures are obsessed with that. that that is a god that is a deity that is a form of divinity of life um the other thing you want to keep in mind is you'll notice that every bridge, even like when a major road crosses a creek, just look, there'll be these giant white sycamore trees that I refer to as quote-unquote ghost trees. These are extremely important. Um, they're often used too. You'll see them at colonial homes. If you see them along roads and then there's like a field, there's probably an old home there that was knocked down a lot of um, early colonials used them because 
they grew huge and they you could see them for miles from a high point to find your way back home you got to remember you know even back in the colonial times there were hardly any roads i've dug up the oldest maps of, of the area and there, there's very few roads um a lot of forest and very few roads um so you gotta kind of rewind your entire mindset and then when you look at my collection you gotta really rewind your mindset especially when archaeologists in North America have this paradigm of you know 12,000 year Clovis culture first yada 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 nonsense (laughs) that's bull crap um yeah people came over land but I think people got here on boat way before that both on the um, west um, coast and on the east coast and this is where uh, a lot of my collection comes in in play Uh, these quarry sites left over by the ancients recycled by other ancients um, stuff clearly going back to 20,000 years stuff that's clearly Salutrian a people from what is nowadays Europe and Southern Europe and uh, England and uh, those areas uh, 20,000 years ago those didn't have any names they did but we had no idea what they were anyways the ice sheet was encroaching on the land the food sources were running out and the only thing they could eat were seals started following the seals and the oceans were way lower and the ice packs moved about four miles an hour and you could get across the ocean in about four to five weeks hunting seals you wouldn't even need much of a boat although i believe they could make plenty good boats out of seal hide neanderthals were sailing around too so anyways the salutrians were here and what they were is absolute geniuses with stonework absolute um as much as we know with our materials that we like to use they knew and um i started realizing this recently at these sites um and you'll you'll see the ghost trees are important more often than not they're at sites where you find either the quarries or large artifacts because these are industry sites and um, sycamore trees are fascinating um, not only do they make great materials for boat boats and little little craft to get around creeks and, and rivers like dugouts and canoes but um, they can grow pretty much anywhere um, the ones around here that are massive they're I don't know 300 to 600 years old Um, they can grow in a desert they can grow anywhere Um, they don't need much they're a form of a maple tree they're sacred they're a sign of divinity Um, they even mark uh, a lot of Susquehanna burials as they would bury their dead in a fetal position with especially their their dead with a higher seed in their society like their chiefs and and, and whatever they call them their, their leaders they would bury them usually on top of hills looking over creeks with the seeds in a leather sack of a sycamore or another tree and as that leather sack rotted that tree would grow consume the body yada 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 um that was another digression you'll find i do that a lot but <laughs> Anyway, these master stone workers um, were using things like sapphire um, and using um, crazy, I would assume, abrasion techniques with, you know, sand, water, and these, these granite tools that we find that look like they're more for cutting stone than anything else. Um, they seem to leave behind... Um, at these quarry sites which all usually correspond with hot springs which is another unique thing in the penny pack because it runs on a fault line i digressed away from that but the geology is crazy a lot of metal too but 
Um, what they were working with is sapphire or corundum is the technical term. Um, and uh, I have a ton of them because I find them like as common as quartz is everywhere. Corundum is in the penny pack. Uh, and what that means is there's pockets of silicate free um, zones, which is really rare because 90% of the earth is covered with silicates like quartz and feldspar. So these pockets then have to be thermally heated to the right temperatures to grow these aluminum oxide crystals, which are what corundum is. Um, the aluminum oxide is clear uh, to, to dull, hazy clear by nature. But then when other trace metals are exposed to the formation of the crystal, and the right processes, you get different colors. Like blue, they become sapphires. In red, they become rubies. And greens become emeralds. These are um, one of the hardest materials second uh, to diamonds only. They're, you know, a thousand times uh, less hard than diamonds, which on the terms of that isn't much different. But a crundum is way more durable than a diamond. It can... Um, be used for industrial things um, and that's what we use it for uh, next time you buy sandpaper look at the fine print it's aluminum oxide it's ground up corundum it is great for abrasion um, they use it to actually polish and shape diamond uh, but they had a hard time even working with this but what you see is um in the natural form, corundum is square and blocky a lot. And we, I found a pound and a half, a two pound ruby, literally a red. And it has sapphire and a blue uh, corundum. And then you find beautiful ones that uh, are way higher grade. And I've even polished some of them. I found a rare star sapphire, but um, a blue corundum or a sapphire is titanium oxide um, or titanium. Titanium you know, is exposed to the process and get blue. Um, red is chromate, which gives you rubies. I have some crazy rare color changing sapphires that go from like a dark slate to bright purple uh, in UV and different uh, shades of light. That has palladium, um, vanadium, chromium um, mixtures that give you that um, that crazy color change print. Um, there's some that are uh, yellow and red. Um, there's all kinds of blue ones. There's one that's red and blue. Uh, they're faceted um, by nature, their, their structure. Uh, and and some, some of the ones that I have that haven't been beat up and polished in the creek as much still retain the faceted shape. And um, there's black sapphire as well. Um, but they were using this and working with this, this much older culture before the Clovis, making these crazy thinner, basically flaked diamond and teardrop type arrowheads, uh, even leaving behind effigies of, of mammoth heads and uh, seals and um, different animals. And uh, it, it's kind of all fascinating, but... Um, as you see various pictures play out before you, my stuff's never really synced up. It's just kind of a tangent or a flow of ideas and information. And I hope you find it interesting, fascinating. And if you do subscribe, spread the word, share your finds if you find the same stuff. Um, love you all. Please subscribe and stay safe, happy, and lost.